I once had a conversation with a buddy of mine, in which I was discussing my first attempt to understand the legacy of anti-Semitism. At the time, I was making a video trying to understand the semiotics of conspiracy theories, and how anti-Semitic tropes underlaid assumptions about evil cabals doing evil. Cabal itself, in fact, comes from Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. It was an interesting conversation with my friend. He's pretty clever. But he was adamant that I was foolish to go back any further than the Holocaust in my research. He said something along the lines of, it's interesting for scholars to look at the Dreyfus affair or the practice of usury, but it's useless for the average citizen, people our age, to look into anything beyond the Holocaust, because that was just the most important thing. It was the climax. He reasoned, it can't get worse than the Holocaust, thus nothing else is really worthy of our time. And I originally took this point within the context of my actual conspiracy series, and I charitably interpreted it at the moment as being a critique about pacing. Which, <laughs> yeah, that video is quite long. But this argument has ruminated in my mind for over a year now, and I remain dumbfounded at his lack of curiosity and his harsh anti-intellectual stance. You know, the pursuit of knowledge itself is unimportant outside of strict utility. This is not an attack on him, but it was emblematic of a certain attitude that I found at the core of a wider problem. Because that lack of curiosity ignores the previous 3,500 years of hatred, and I covered this history from antiquity all the way up to the French Revolution in my first video. And in the second, I covered the rise of eugenics, the invention of anti-Semitism, and the trial of Alfred Dreyfus. That video was about the first half of modern anti-Semitism, and with this video I intend on covering the rest of what differentiates it from the previous phases of anti-Semitism. I don't believe that everyone is as ignorant as my friend, but I do believe the world is deeply informed by the legacy of anti-Semitism, and we cannot begin to understand how this hatred has influenced our language and our social structures. So let's investigate the more contemporary history of anti-Semitism by traveling to this small colony island in... what is it called? America? The American War for Independence led, in part, to the downfall of the French monarchy, and after fighting their own civil war to decide whether or not they thought slavery was bad, surprisingly, they decided that it was. Bad for their economy, not for moral reasons. America was becoming a global economic power, and because of its well-known wealth and prosperity, known as the American Dream, many immigrants from around the world left their homes to make it in America. The development of American identity in the early 20th century is chronicled in Sarah Churchwell's book, Behold America. Her focus is mainly on America's adoption of Nazism in the 1930s, but the groundwork she lays is useful for our purposes. Philosophically, Post-Civil War America was represented by two opposing ideals. First we have the aforementioned American Dream. America saw itself as a kingdom atop a hill. They broke free of British colonial rule, and they believed themselves to be a uniquely shining beacon of democracy. Ah, papa! Let's ignore you, Haiti. Mayhaps chuck a couple of, uh, sanctions on you for, you know, doing what America did, but being black. This notion created a lot of nationalism, and America, according to these Americans, was uniquely special and great, and thus they were entitled to the world. This idea became known as America First. America determined its own path in history by breaking from colonial rule, and thus they were as independent as any nation. But at the same time, they were very insecure about being a new nation amongst ones that had existed for hundreds of years. The notion of America first posed that Americans should only get involved in global politics if it was advantageous to them, while proclaiming moral superiority and nationalism. Before the Civil War, most immigrants had come from Northern Europe, England, Scotland, Ireland, Germany, Holland, and Scandinavia. But between 1870 and 1914, nearly 25 million people would arrive mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe. 
So nationalism was not unique to America, especially at this time, but as we shall see, the unique racial laws America created to deal with former slaves fostered a land that saw the American people as the greatest civilization of the world. They liked the American dream, but they despised immigrants. This is why they oscillate between extremes. The ideals of a country's origin constantly came up against ideas of supremacy and profit. Making America particularly complicated was its legacy of freeing African slaves. Having used Enlightenment ideals to justify slavery, they had built their entire constitution and economy around the idea of black Americans being free fifths as worthy of their white counterparts. One of the things that people have to bear in mind is that when we think about slavery, it was an economic system, and the demise of slavery at the end of the Civil War uh, left the Southern economy in tatters, and they were formerly kind of the integral part of the economic production system in the South, and now those people are free. The 13th Amendment loophole was immediately exploited. After the Civil War, African Americans were arrested in mass. It was our nation's first prison boom. You were basically a slave again. The 13th Amendment says that, hey, except for criminals, everybody else is free. Well, now if you're criminalized, that doesn't apply to you. What you got after that was on a rapid transition to a kind of mythology of black criminality. They would say that the Negro is out of control, that there's a threat of violence uh, to white women, so the same sort of image we had of Uncle Remus and these genial kind of black figures was replaced by this rapacious, uh, you know, menacing Negro male evil uh, that had to be banished. Because of this, and despite being an ethnically diverse country, to be American was to be a white supremacist. Even more so in many other European countries because these ideals were codified into law. America was pure in its ideals and its lineage, as Churchwell writes. All these purities was presented as if not equivalent, then correlated. Pure heart, pure Americanism, splendid patriotism, pure white blood, admirable culture, high achievement, fine ideals, pure race integrity, each becomes inextricable from the other. From the pure Americanism of the America first to the pure blood in a few easy rhetorical steps. This supremacy and fear of the other led to some implicit social laws that were difficult to traverse. There was a kind of black-white racial dichotomy that every citizen had to contend with, because to be American, to be worthy of respect, was to be white, and to be un-American was to be black. These twisted social rules were informed by so-called one-drop laws. Black Americans were not the only people impacted by this. Irish Americans, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, and many other ethnicities were placed onto this binary, because anyone who was not American enough was ethically considered black. In his marvellous book, The Price of Whiteness, historian Eric Goldstein chronicles the first waves of Jewish immigration to America. The allure of the American dream was tantalising to many groups of immigrants, but the prospect of starting anew was what attracted some Jews to leave Europe and try and make it in America. Jews initially found America quite accommodating. Although the United States was populated almost entirely by people of European descent, they didn't bring along Europe's historic Judeophobia. Which is very interesting. Late in the 1800s, even around the time of the Dreyfus Affair, white land-owning Americans held Jews up as paragons of modernity. Native-born whites during this period tended to see Jews' economic success and their perceived links to civilization as characteristics that affirmed their membership in the dominant racial grouping. Instead of casting Jewish racial particularity as an obstacle to whiteness, most white Americans saw the survival of the Jewish race through the centuries as a sign that Jews exemplified white power and superiority. The Jew was a white man, declared a Midwestern journalist in 1851 and therefore a member of the God-appointed ruling progressive race of humanity. Similarly, although ethnologist Josiah Clark Knott saw the Jews as a remarkably uniform race, he still welcomed them as honoured members of the great Caucasian family. Because they had survived for so long in the face of adversity, and many European immigrants had white skin, these Jews were generally regarded with respect. The 1870s through to the 1900s were a pretty good time to be Jewish in America. Especially when we consider what was happening in Europe. I find this to be particularly fascinating because we have these conflicting ideas of race and religion being integrated into a fundamentally religious society. By exploring how these American Jews saw themselves, 
we can further understand the importance of race in the American psyche. Many congregations tried really hard to assimilate into American society. For example, we have the Reform Judaism movement, which relaxed some worship-related traditions and social expectations to come across as more appropriately American. There were many Orthodox congregations as well, of course, but many American Jews found themselves in remarkably progressive groups of people for the 1800s. We will discuss this a bunch in a moment, but due to their previous persecution in Europe and their newfound privilege, Jews were more likely to have sympathy for black Americans, and some reform synagogues used said privilege to support poor black Americans. Because Jews generally reaped good rewards for being white, the question of race as a point of self-definition was heavily discussed in these spaces. As I've mentioned several times throughout this series, Jews have been seen as a race since at least the 1500s, but Jews as a whole never really adopted the idea of race because it was always used as a tool of oppression. In America, where race meant everything, Jews found themselves defining themselves by their Jewish race. They did not use race in the simple black-white dichotomy as the Americans, but they thought of a multitude of complicated factors like ethnicity and shared ancestry. This meant that the role of women in Reform and Orthodox movements became increasingly important. I'm finally going to speak about the ladies. Ish? Nah. Isha! Judaism jokes. As I mentioned in the beginning of the last episode, male historians of Jewish history don't really speak about the role of women as much as I would like them to. And that's one of the reasons why I really liked the price of whiteness as much as I did. Because when you accept eugenics and racial principles into your worldview, the role of women comes into a constant and dehumanizing contention. Jewish women didn't get as many rights legally as their male counterparts because it was the 1800s. It's worth discussing that much of the eugenic science that was used to suppress black and Asian people was also used to suppress women's rights. That would have to be a series unto itself, but for now, Jewish women had a bit more autonomy in the States than they would have had in Europe. Because of the Reform Judaism movement and the growing secularity of society, Jewish women became a very important resource to maintain the Jewish race. So amongst 19th century Jews, although they were fairly liberal about sexual relations outside of marriage, women marrying outside of the faith became seen as the death knell of Jewish society. Jewish women, however, because they lagged behind men in their attainment of social integration, often found themselves in a largely Jewish world where they had less of a need to employ a racial definition of Jewishness. Instead of easing their incursions into the wider world, racial Jewishness, as articulated by men, pointed to their home as their proper sphere and assigned them a rigid set of roles. Women who sought access to non-Jewish society felt they could gain it most effectively by employing a religious definition of Judaism, since American society justified women's entry into the public sphere by stressing the beneficial effect of their religious and moral influence. Women became commoditized in a peculiar way, especially because of the maternal nature of the religion. Jewish women had always been fetishized by Jewish men for this reason, and Jews are not alone in this because men in general are bad and they are possessive of women and they fear their autonomy. But women's relations were judged more harshly in America. They were expected to be paragons of virtue and homogeneity. As the 19th century ended, wider American society became more interested in how Jews fit into said society. Most of the Orthodox and Reform Jews that we've spoken about generally settled in the northern states of New York and Chicago. But in the deep south of Atlanta and New Orleans, the locals were more concerned with whether Jews were white or black. I've been avoiding talking about the subject because I felt as if this was the right place to bring it up here. Of course, Jews exist in every ethnicity imaginable. Asia has a sizable Jewish population. There are African Jews, Inuit Jews, and there are Jews all across Europe. Race is slippery, and as we have discussed throughout this series, the origins of the concept was as a tool of oppression. Jews tend to identify with subtler concepts like ethnicity. For example, Jews are more likely to say, my family is Jewish and from Germany. But this nuance didn't really exist in the late 1800s in America because of the dichotomy. Many white Americans, who were very invested in persecuting black Americans, really needed to know where Jews fit onto the binary. The initial sentiments of Jews being representatives of a strong and proud race began to dry up, and the Jews were sort of stuck in the middle. They greatly benefited from having white privilege, 
but they were sympathetic to black suffrage and black self-determinism. And because they were sympathetic, Southern whites wanted to consider the Jew as black themselves, because no self-respecting white person would ever be sympathetic to black people. This was made yet more complicated with a large wave of immigration from Eastern Europe. White Americans tended to see Jews as part of a whole rather than as individuals, so when Jews with darker skin complexion started arriving, it stoked the fires of debate. The prospect of the American dream only continued to grow over time, and this new wave, according to Goldstein, was more resistant to assimilation than their European counterparts. Among the new arrivals from Eastern Europe were more than two million Jews, most fleeing poverty and many escaping anti-Semitic violence. Some Jews who had already been in America for generations were also wary of the newcomers. We are Americans, and they are not, one rabbi said. They gnaw the bones of past centuries. Very few Eastern European Jews were part of reform movements, and this is not to blame them because, and I cannot stress this enough, Jews should not have to assimilate in order not to be attacked. White Americans and their binary thinking only grew more confused and desperate to racialize Jews as a whole. Newspapers started to adopt old stereotypes of large noses and thick lips, and they were often drawn to look similarly to black Americans. As the decades began to pass, the second generation of Jewish immigrants wanted to assimilate and form their own Jewish identity, and this created even more conflict within the Jewish community. While in the North, things got a bit worse and the initial sheen of acceptance began to sway, the Southern state became even more violent. Most emblematic for our purposes was a young factory worker named Leo Frank. He was found guilty of murdering his boss's 13-year-old daughter. Subsequently, he was lynched by a white mob in 1915. The story of Leo Frank is as fascinating as the Dreyfus affair, and much like the sensationalist coverage with that case, Frank is considered to be completely innocent by modern historians. But for our purposes, this murder was one of several cases of Jews being falsely accused of interacting with white women and girls improperly. The link between the Jew and black as sexual predators was also made during the Leo Frank case of 1913 to 1915. The Frank case was one of the worst anti-Semitic outbursts in American history, inspired by the frustration of Southerners over the difficult process of industrialization of which Frank became a symbol. Southern men were especially disturbed during this period by the challenges that a changing economy and the increased need for women to take up factory work posed to their perceived roles as protectors and sustainers of the family. Historians have missed, however, how whites sometimes tried to suppress the specific frustrations motivating their hatred of Frank by cloaking him in imagery usually reserved for blacks. Every student of sociology knows, journalist Tom Watson wrote in early 1915, that the black man's lust after the white woman is not much fiercer than the lust of the licentious Jew for the Gentile. Because of the integration of Eastern European Jews, most white southerners considered Jews to be black and they were subject to many of the same injustices as black Americans. Something else that was small but furthered the divide was when black Americans gave support to Alfred Dreyfus, to which the Jewish community generally thanked them. Many of these factors only increased Jewish sympathy for black Americans. Using what privilege they had, Jews tried to help poor black populations as much as possible. In doing so, they continued to walk a tightrope of acceptance in America. The most prominent academic example of this would be Franz Boas, pictured here posing himself as the missing link. This photo is beautiful. <laughs> Boas was a secular Jew, and he is now lionized in anti-racist literature. He was an anthropologist, and he worked hard to undermine race science and advocated for a kind of psychic unity between all of mankind. To quote Sussman, To Boas, similarity of the human mind meant that all peoples in all societies shared similar mental processes, and one of the major foci of Boas' research agenda was to seek the laws of these shared human mental processes. To Boas, the organization of the human mind was essentially identical amongst all past and present human societies, and among all races and mental activity followed the same laws everywhere. In a time where legislation based on dodgy intelligence testing got people sterilized for not being white and smart enough, Boas was a radical. He didn't really take up the questions of racial anti-Semitism until the rise of the Nazi regime, which we will discuss in chapter three. It was around this time that Zionism made its way to America. Zionists were very keen on the notion of Jews being part of a race, and they aimed to downplay physical characteristics while encouraging racial separateness. 
In doing so, they wanted Jews to continue to define themselves as something apart from whiteness. We will discuss Zionism further in the next chapter, but this further angered white Americans. Interestingly, it was around this time that white Americans became the most invested in the notion of Semitism. Where it was once a signifier of long-standing tradition, it became associated with Africa and further blackness. The notion of the Jew infiltrating and undermining the standards of white society soon mingled with the popular image of the Jew as communist, especially during the years of the Depression when both Jews and African Americans were conspicuous in American communist circles. This stereotype took root deeply in the South, where the threat of communist infiltration was most closely linked to fears of an African American assertion of power. In several southern states, Jewish communists, usually transplants from the North, were active in organizing black workers during the Great Depression and became widely seen as troublemakers by local whites. It was in this context, arriving in the 1920s, that Jews felt more stuck than ever. They felt a kind of desire to defend their heritage as Jews, but they feared being ostracized for speaking about their racial distinctiveness. Because although we see race as a social construct now, at this time, race was political. Not defending yourself means that you could offend white supremacists and you could get lynched. Jews started to feel fear in America for the first time in a few generations. And it was in this context arrives the largest disseminator of anti-Semitism in American history. Have you ever come across a celebrity's Wikipedia page and it goes something along the lines of like, childhood, early career, hate crimes. I'm looking at you, Marky Mark. Yeah. If you happen to find that kind of thing entertaining, then the legacy of Henry Ford will deeply entertain you. It is well documented that Henry Ford, the 20th century's most famous industrialist inventor and rich capitalist, was a proud and open anti-Semite. The automobile pioneer Henry Ford blamed Jews for everything from Lincoln's assassination to the change he thought he detected in the flavor of his favorite candy bar. To the point that Adolf Hitler had a photo of Ford on his office wall. Ford was one of the few Americans to receive the Grand Service Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle, the highest accolade a foreigner could ever receive in fascist Germany. On his 57th birthday, no less. So, yeah, he's problematic. Consider getting a Holden. Or don't. I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. Maybe Holden is like an anti-Semite. Probably. Henry Ford left a tremendous legacy across American capitalism. And he was an individual who was the most responsible for the dissemination of the final piece of the puzzle of modern anti-Semitism. Before we could discuss that, we need to understand why Ford had such a bee in his bonnet about Jews. In the concisely titled Henry Ford and the Jews, Historian Neil Boldman reports that Ford had never actually met any Jewish person until his early 20s. But due to his admiration of men like Thomas Edison and Ford growing up in the wake of the controversies of Jewish immigration, he grew to harbor a deep, irrational hatred towards Jews. He claimed to not have a problem with individual Jews, instead he believed that collectively Jews were behind the world's ills. Recession, communism, the Great War, the list did not end. During this time, he invented the T-model convertible, a car for the middle class, and this made him extraordinarily rich. We will discuss Ford's apparent reverence for the lower classes later in this chapter, but his cheap cars and rags to riches story made him very popular in America, especially in his hometown of Detroit. According to Churchwell, Ford had been nominated for a greatest person in history poll. He came in third after Napoleon and Jesus. Now, of course, this is an obscure newspaper poll, but I think it's emblematic of how popular he was in his own time. Churchwell and Baldwin also describe his presidential ambitions, all of which came to nothing. Ford was so memorable in the American psyche because he was the epitome of the American dream. He was the son of Irish and Belgian immigrants. He raised himself out of poverty and he became incomprehensibly rich. Adjusted for inflation, estimates go up as high as $200 billion. Someone with lots of social responsibility and influence, hey. So he decided to buy his own newspaper to express his unrepentant anti-Semitism. Ford had something of a motto, and it's very useful in trying to help us understand the psychology of the anti-Semite. He was fond of saying, history is more or less the bunk. 
Now, for the conspiracy theory fans out there, bunk of course is short for misinformation. What Ford means to say here is that we always have the ability to craft our own version of history out of the elements we like and dislike, and then we can rearrange them to suit whatever our own purposes are. And because of this loosey-goosey attitude towards reality, he was sued to hell and back for outrageous label, label for outrageous libel. Several times! The paper in which he printed most of his falsehoods was called The Dearborn Independent. It had a readership of about 700 to 900,000 people in Detroit, Michigan. The paper was run by Ford's personal assistant and most entrusted employee, Ernst Leibold. The paper would run at a severe deficit for the entirety of its time in press. It lost so much money that Ford entered a clause into the contracts of anyone who bought one of his T-Mobile cars that in buying his car, they were automatically subscribed to his paper. He even forced his employees and salesmen to sell subscriptions of their papers to their friends and families. The paper still lost around $200,000, close to 3 million US dollars after inflation, per year. But it didn't matter. Because while Ford would have preferred the paper to have been profitable, he primarily wanted to have a soapbox to speak his own mind, unrestrained by having to censor his own thoughts for advertisers. As a lifelong conspiracy theorist and eugenicist, Ford hated many things, but he particularly hated Zionism and Communism. Let's start with the former. This is already like a numbered list, so part A, Zionism. As you will remember from the previous episode, Zionism was forged out of the ashes of the Dreyfus Affair. It is the notion that Jews, after four millennia of untold suffering, should return to their homeland in the southern Levant. Now before I go on, I want to take a minute just to talk about the different types of Zionism because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot and no one seems to understand the breadth of the ideologies that fall underneath the umbrella. There are different types of political Zionism like, well, political Zionism. Founded by Theodore Herzl himself, this was the vanilla, the most classic variety. Herzl aimed to establish a homeland in Palestine that would be legally assured and internationally recognized. The aim being to be recognized as a state insofar as it protects the state from outside harm. Then we have practical Zionism, in which people rush to establish a state and then worry about the details later, prioritizing getting people together and keeping them safe. And then we have cultural Zionism, which is more of a symbolic movement. Jerusalem is seen as the spiritual and cultural home of Judaism, and the culture it represents is more important than the actual legal state itself. Of course, these are practical approaches, as to what Israel should represent, but when people actually get there, there are further fractures and disagreements. We have Liberal and Labour Zionism, which no, I don't mean the two Australian political parties. Instead, we respectively have an Agrarian Bolshevism, which I think should actually be called Green Zionism, and a socially and economically liberal state of affairs. After that, we have the Free R's, Revisionist Zionism, which is economically liberal but socially fascist towards its Arab-Israeli neighbours. Religious Zionism, which goes hard in the theism, saying that Jews are the children of God and thus they have the moral obligation to maintain the state. And Revolutionary Zionism, which is a mix of the previous two. All of this is fascinating and useful to know, especially if one is actually going to criticise the state of Israel. But anti-Semites don't know about any of this. They don't know about, like, Diaspora Zionism, Synthetic Zionism, Reform Zionism, Post-Zionism. They don't care, because to the anti-Semites, Zionism is not a political movement about people. Instead, it's an abstract boogeyman. Zionism reified is a catch-all for thing me no like. Zionism to the anti-Semite represents a unity that they find tremendously threatening. And this unity is demonstrably untrue, because if there is one thing <laughs> that I have learned during all of this research, it is that no one is better at disagreeing with one another than Jews are. Zionism is hotly contested in these communities, especially when it comes to its relations with Palestine, and all of these political and philosophical movements are only scratching the surface. It is threatening to the anti-Semite because this complexity itself contradicts the narrative that Jews are hell-bound on destroying Western society. But you might ask yourself, why pick Zionism specifically? Well, actually, we've already answered that question. Historically, the answer to the question why Jews were quote-unquote evil was because they hated Jesus Christ, when, in fact, they were pretty neutral about Jesus himself, and, of course, Christ himself was actually a Jew. Like with the anti-Semitic adoption of eugenics, anti-Semites needed a new boogeyman to pin all of their beliefs onto, 
a, a wretched donkey's tail, if you will. Zionism is the new philosophy that replaces the hatred of Christ. Anti-Semites argue that Jews are loyal to other Jews first and foremost because not only is their religion backwards, but their race is intrinsically deterministic. Which, as we have already discussed, is nonsense. Remember how Christians framed the Old Testament God as cruel, while their God was compassion. It's the exact same line of logic. The Zionist sector influences the shape of anti-Semitism, but it doesn't give us everything. We can get the other piece in Henry Ford's hatred of Bolshevism. Part B. Bolshevism. Hell yeah! The idea that society shouldn't be organized by having rich people own property and poor people using said property for the owner's profit. Being a multi-billionaire, Ford felt threatened by this, and true to his character he was incoherent as to why he thought Jews wanted to spread socialism to the masses. Anti-Semitic myths going back as far as the Napoleonic Wars have stated that Jews in the banking industry have attempted to influence global politics. It still has its roots in the political climate of today, with anti-Semites and conspiracy theorists blaming the Rothschilds or George Soros for wanting to spread socialism, despite themselves being ultra-wealthy capitalists. Just a heads up, if you're from South Africa, you probably want to skip you this skip, sketch. skip this, this bullshit. It would be irresponsible of me not to mention that these anti-Semites are incoherent about what policy, from day to day, is meant to be pushed. Because sometimes Jews are communists trying to take down capitalism, and on other days, Jews are capitalists trying to destroy the working class. Or Jewish men are weak and effeminate, or Jewish men are a sexual threat to, to non-Jewish women. These are contradictory beliefs that are illogical, that don't bother anti-Semites. So how do you fight back against that with logic? This is what I've called the dialectic liquidity of the imagined Jew. The ability to change motivations on a whim to decide what you are against is important for understanding how this works. Ford's wealth led him to have anti-communist sentiments, which he campaigned strongly against in the unionization of his factories. At the same time, he fought other rich capitalists in Europe who were Jews were trying to take him down. We have these two ideas, Zionism and Bolshevism, and we can get a picture as to why anti-Semites don't like Jews because they can just project whatever they don't like onto them. But these two ideas, without a structure, come across as incoherent and self-contradictory. You can say that all Jews are Zionists, only loyal to their state, but that is philosophically incompatible with socialism, which is explicitly anti-religious. Internal logic fails, and you can't be taken seriously as a movement. So this is where Ford comes back into the picture because his greatest contribution towards the widespread adoption of anti-Semitism in America and abroad was his publishing of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Part Z, the Protocols. Ford published the Protocols under the title The International Jew, a title suggested by his secretary, Ernst Liebold. The International Jew was the reported minutes, stolen by a spy, of the meeting of THE secret cabal of Jews that control the world. DEFINITELY. These protocols, 24 in total, are supposedly meant to be the laws of the New World Order. The International Jew, nor any of the translations, have an author attributed to them. Not because the supposed spy wanted to remain anonymous, but because whoever they were they stole the entirety of their book from other authors. Of course, the protocols are forged, and they have several different fiction authors. On Wikipedia alone, you can see that there are a segment from Maurice Jolly's satire, the dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. That was apparently such a good satire that apparently anti semites didn't know it was one. This wasn't a mistake, of course. It is insidious. Since the original publishing in Russia in the early 1900s, the protocols have incited pogroms and they have been used to justify cruelty. It is considered to be one of the most infamous anti-Semitic texts of our modern age. The reason is that whereas the Dreyfus Affair normalized racial hatred of Jews, the protocols gave a structure as to how Jews were supposedly plotting evil. You have the two conflicting ideas, right, of Zionism and Bolshevism. And using the structure of the protocols, you can snap these two incoherent ideas into something resembling coherence. There are 24 different protocols after all, and they all call for different methods of deception in different areas of society. The reason for the dissonance between beliefs is that the cabal is just so clever that they themselves can make the fundamentally different ideas meld together. Their very evil warps reality itself, and that evil justifies all of the nonsense theories. 
It is from the protocols that we get the imagery of a dark room, a long table with evil bankers and politicians plotting evil deeds. This structure is also useful to the anti-Semite because of its bipartisan nature. As we have explored with Nuremberg's work, much of what he said about how Judaism underlays assumptions applies here. We know that the left and the right can use these tropes to push political goals, but we haven't really discussed why it works so well. What gave anti-Semitic ideas their power was not so much their relation to reality, but rather their exemption from reality checks. That is, from the critical testing to which so many other concepts were subjected. The fact that anti-Semitic thoughts and beliefs do not hold up to intellectual rigour is not a defect, it is a strength. The anti-Semite pushes anti-Semitism because it is something that he wants to be true, because if it were, it would justify his beliefs and validate his existence. The act of saying something wills it into existence. Anti-Semitism provides its adherents with a cognitive comfort. The fantasy that the gap between our understanding of the cosmos and its fearful complexity does not exist. The protocols prey on anxieties about power relations between the rich and the poor. They weren't logical exactly, but the protocols were emotionally potent. They described something that many people felt in their bellies throughout history, but were unable to articulate. All of the world's evil is manufactured by a small group of bad people who are funda- All the world's evil is manufactured by a small group of bad people who fundamentally think different to you and I. And if we were able to stop these evildoers, then the world would be forever peaceful. This is why the Protocols are a foundational piece in the history of modern conspiracism as well. And finally looping back around, Ford used the Dearborn Independence to, in serial fashion, publish and disseminate the Protocols to American society. It is important to clearly state that there were protests and complaints against this blatant bigotry. Ford was sued and forced to place an apology in the independent paper, the apology itself being something he did not write, and he gave his signature to the apology without reading it. Neil Baldwin gives us dozens of examples of rabbis and prominent members of Detroit personally contacting Ford and confronting him about his beliefs, to which he would act dumbfounded by their confrontation. His excuse of individual Jews not being responsible for international Jewry being a personal favourite of his telling these members that they were the good ones and they needed to help fight against bankers or something. It is interesting to note that perplexingly, Ford saw himself as an advocate for the working class. Of course he's famous for introducing the 5 day work week and a $5 wage to his factories, and because of this he saw himself as protecting the people from the spectre of international capitalism. The bad kind, I guess. Giving the working Joe a leg up in the rat race of life. In terms of his actual class allegiances, he treated his employees very poorly in exchange for giving them like a decent wage, which anyone should do. He wanted to make sure that they were Anglo-Saxon in their composure and origin. His managers would raid workers' lockers to make sure that they were not harboring any kind of anti-capitalist paraphernalia, and he would be hesitant to give jobs to men who didn't plan on having little white babies or getting married. Ford's wife even threatened to divorce him if he didn't give in to the unionization efforts to combat this, which he eventually did in the late 1930s. The timeline in which Ford was sued for libel and had his paper shut down is very long and complicated, and this segment of the video is already growing a bit long. But it's worth covering one last connection here. Henry Ford, despite being the very poster boy for the American dream, would go on to become a much admired figure by the Nazis. Chapter 3. Oops! You did a fascism. Yikes! Do better! It's well documented that high-ranking Nazis praised Ford for his public anti-Semitism. Modern mainstream publications have a high old time condemning Ford and his connections to Nazi Germany because it is easy to blame individual people. When we wade into the territory of how the Nazis admired the Americans, we must be careful where we step. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, many sources are reluctant to dig into the weeds of this topic because it makes America look quite bad. And more interestingly to me, we must be careful not to overstate the influence of the American model of racism and anti-Semitism on Nazi Germany because it can diminish what made Germany so uniquely abhorrent. Far leftists, like myself, tend to say America is literally Nazi Germany whenever they do things that are bad, and do not make a mistake, fuck America, white supremacist neoliberal nonsense land. 
but I think it would be intellectually dishonest for me to claim that there is a direct one-to-one -one comparison to be made here. With that in mind, I plan to word this next section very carefully. If we cast our minds back to chapter one, America had this black-white dichotomy that underlaid many of the legal assumptions of their states. Their Jim Crow and anti-miscegenation laws were particularly brutal and cruel, and the Nazis liked that quite a lot. It is easy to claim that Nazis used American laws of racial oppression as a direct model, and you would be partially right. They were so impressed by the Americans for how clean and efficient miscegenation and segregation worked, but it would be misleading to say that they stole from America completely. At least that's the argument the historian James Whitman makes in his book Hitler's American Model, and I'm generally inclined to agree. Now James is a good writer, and his research skills should certainly be commended, but he's a bit of a liberal, and I was hoping for his analysis to be more intersectional than it was. I wanted him to delve further into the very failures of liberalism of law that put into motion the rise of fascism in the 20th century. But I must put aside my own critiques of his work to focus on what is actually in the text itself, because you cannot just judge an author of what they don't talk about. You must try to absorb what they think is actually important. His bias for the inherent justness of the law system and liberalism aside, Whitman convincingly argues that there are caveats that must be made when comparing Nazi Germany to America. For one, and as much as some of us might disagree, America was a democracy in its constitution. A leader could not lead for life, they must accept elections. And in principle, the government is at the whim of the people. According to Whitman, the Nazis abhorred America in its best moments. The internal logic of eugenics and national socialism requires democracy to be disregarded because it will inevitably lead to degenerates being able to vote and organize. And as we have explored, America certainly had eugenic tendencies, and I'm not going to well actually you. That's just a fact. The dichotomy of white or black impressed Hitler, and American white supremacy was not democratic because white supremacy is not democratic. There was a character to American racism, differentiated from the European racism, that was knowingly nasty. The Americans reveled in the arbitrariness and subjectivity of their laws. As Whitham says, the mischievous character intrigued the Nazis and allowed them to expand these laws into extremes without precedent in white countries. A lot of ink has been spilled writing about the obviously flawed and illogical characteristics of the Nuremberg Laws, which legalized racial segregation of Jews and others deemed degenerate. Many authors, when dealing with the legacy of the Nuremberg Laws, bathe in indignation over the ludicrous double standards. A Jew is anyone descended from at least three grandparents who are racially full Jews. But then it is said that a grandparent shall be considered as a full Jew if he or she belonged to the Jewish religious community. So the Nazis determined your race by the religious affiliations of your grandparents? As for mixed of the second degree, those born to a half Jew and German, in other words, one quarter Jew, three quarter German equals German, with exceptions. If both parents rather than one are mixed blood, the child's Jew. If the child is very Jewish looking or sounding, even with only one quarter mixed blood. When that blood is dominant. Then he is a Jew. Third exception, a mixed second who has a criminal or political record. Excuse me, sir, is this a, a second or a third? A mixed second. Third exception. Third exception. And look, both of these examples are ridiculous. They're using objective language to describe subjective and petty impulses. But it would be a mistake to view this as purely illogical. Because the Nazis were logical to a fault. Their logic was, anything that strengthens the white race is good and anything that dilutes it was bad. The Nuremberg Laws were exactly as logical as they needed to be. Because whoever I deem a degenerate is a degenerate. The internal logic of Nazism thrives upon that mischievous character. They were on a team, and anything that scored a point was the rules, and anything that didn't was illegal. To pretend otherwise would be to ignore why the laws were made in the first place. America's miscegenation laws were racist and illogical, so why would they share any pretenses of justice and freedom? The Nazis were clearly deeply interested in the American example, but it would be a mistake to draw overblown conclusions about the direct influence of the American model on the citizenship law. There was never any possibility that the Nazis would copy the citizenship law directly from what they found in American parallels, no matter how much they praised them. America may have been the global leader in the creation of racist law, well known and much cited before Hitler came to power. But as the Nazis regularly observed, American law was not open about its racist goals, at least when it came to citizenship and immigration. The Nazi party transformed the German state into a death machine that would kill 11 million innocent civilians. 
during the events of World War II. Six million of them, Jews, were murdered in concentration camps. It's impossible to talk about anti-Semitism and not mention the Holocaust. It has been described as the greatest crime in the history of humanity. There is no comparison. The state set out to ethnically cleanse entire populations, and due to mechanization and technology, they nearly did it within the span of a few years. And I'm not going to go into depth about it. Not because I'm afraid to. I have written about plenty of sensitive subjects before, and I've done my homework to make sure that my logic is internally consistent. But I believe that, even if I made this segment three hours long, it would still ultimately be reductive. You can't convey the scale of the Holocaust in one hour, two hours, or even nine really. There is just so much to talk about, and a video essay by an undergraduate with no primary sources is not a good place to get all of your information from. Besides, you've probably heard about most of what I would talk about anyway. You learn about the Holocaust in school, you see it weaponized against Jews today. So instead of giving you a watered down history, I'm going to recommend you a few sources. Firstly, Shoah from 1985 is a tremendously important documentary. You should absolutely watch it. It's nine hours, and the other documentaries that Claude Landsman filmed during this time are also worthwhile seeing. It's for free on YouTube. Secondly, I'm going to recommend Lawrence Hess's book, The Holocaust, A New History. It features unique interviews with perpetrators and survivors that aren't available elsewhere. It effortlessly explains the myriad of complicated factors leading to the rise of Nazi Germany. Thirdly, I'm going to recommend that you seek a copy of Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He was a psychologist, and he gave his first-hand account of what life was like in the death camps. His insights are breathtaking to say the least. Next, I'm going to recommend that you watch The Sorrow and the Pity from 1969, in which Vichy friends exposed French willingness to work with the Nazis. The Dreyfus Affair left a massive dent in the French psyche, and it was in part why French authorities were so easily persuaded to help capture and execute French Jews. I'm also going to cautiously recommend Night and Fog from 1956, which is a violently graphic documentation of the conditions of the death camps, viewer discretion and all. I'm also going to recommend some films. While they are fiction, they are based on actual history. Conspiracy from 2001 is a drama recounting the Wangsi Conference. For those of you who don't know, this was a conference where the Holocaust was decided upon, where orders of gas chambers were made, and where the use of Cyclone B was presented to the highest members of the Nazi authority. As a film, it's like the dark inverse of Twelve Angry Men and it subtly shows the failures of protecting people in the guise of law. The Grey Zone from 2001 dramatizes an uprising in Auschwitz, and it focuses on the inner lives of some imprisoned Sonderkommandos, who are forced to burn the Jewish dead. It is... a nightmare. Son of Soul from 2015 follows a Hungarian Sonderkommando's personal quest to make meaning out of his life. It's shot all in one take, and it is a feat of filmmaking. Ida from 2013 is a poignant reflection on Christianity and its role in the Shoah. It's also one of the most gorgeously photographed movies I've ever seen, and it explores the emotional aftershocks of the Shoah, and it shows how people, who are not even young enough to remember the Holocaust, can still have their lives ruined by it. 1945 from 2015 is a fantastic examination of the cowardice that led to Jews being forced out of their homes, and the shame of the people now living in them. It plays out like a moving play, and it is tremendously tense. Come and See, from 1985, tells the story of the Holocaust from a Soviet perspective, and it's a reminder that this crime aimed to wipe out all Eastern European peoples. It's infamous as one of the most messed up movies ever made, but it's a must watch for anyone who is interested in this topic. It does not escape my notice that all of these texts were made by men. I just haven't seen anything by Jewish women about the Holocaust. I also have my own critiques on some of these authors, Lonsman in particular, but everything above hurt my feelings and they are really worth seeing. Part 2. God help us. <laughs> Chapter 4. Fetishize the past. 
Something that's important to talk about before we head any further into this video is a fallacy that arises when we speak about the Holocaust. Historians describe it as this huge event that eviscerated entire populations of people, and we use the term Holocaust to describe the ethnic cleansing of the gas chambers, the political assassinations of undesirable public servants, and the camps where millions were made to work to death in the name of Lebensraum. Collectively, Holocaust covers this wide array of crimes against humanity. But there are some problems with this. On a strict terminology level, Holocaust is a flawed word. It comes from the Greek holocaustin, meaning burnt offering. This was the word Nazis used, invoking Noah, burning an offering to stop the great deluge that killed mankind for its sins. This is why Jewish people tend to use the Hebrew word Shoah. When we speak about the wider history of anti-Judaism and the Holocaust-specific place within it, recounters of history must be careful not to convey the idea that the Holocaust was the culmination or the climax of anti-Semitism in Europe. Because that is a deterministic argument, and it supposes that the Holocaust had to happen, that it was simply inevitable. This is a fallacy. We know that the rise of Nazi Germany was due to dozens of complicated factors of chance. A global economic depression led to desperation, and the failures of the Weimar Republic, along with the abnormally harsh penalties enacted by the Treaty of Versailles, led to extremist parties rising and taking power. Germany was not uniquely anti-Semitic. A constant theme in the study of the Holocaust is that if you told someone in the early 20th century that a state was going to enact ethnic cleansing on a never before seen scale in Europe, few would have picked Germany. Lawrence Hess says that many people in this hypothetical scenario would have said Russia. The nasty connotation of all of this history is that this forces us to return to an age old fallacy of the Jews bringing their own persecution onto themselves. This does not mean that we cannot blame the Holocaust on Nazi Germany. We must. But we have to view this historical event in the complicated political and social environment that it took place in. Antisemitism was not predestined or deterministic. People fought the Nazis, and there were countless Jewish rebellions against Nazi power. You have got to remember that. History is not deterministic. No one had to die at the hands of fascism. And I've done my best throughout this series to stress that persecution was never Jews' fault. <sighs> Enough of that. Let's return to someone who we started talking about at the beginning of this series. Dara Horn is an acclaimed Jewish author, and her book, People Love Dead Jews, is just marvellous. The book is sprawling in scope, yet intimately written, and one of the many fascinating topics that she covers is Holocaust fetishism. Or rather, she's interested in how the Holocaust has been commodified by popular culture. This crime is one of the most important events in human history, and we struggle to convey its importance concisely. So some people rely on shorthand and metaphor to convey the entirety of the horror and depravity of it all. Let's start off with a contemporary reaction. Horn starts off her book with an essay about the legacy of Anne Frank. In preparation for this video, I did read her diary, and I now understand why it's so powerful to so many people. Young Miss Frank had a remarkable voice and a true talent for writing. The diary itself has sold over 30 million copies worldwide, and part of the appeal of it is that you can vicariously touch what it felt like to live through this event. And the tragedy of her murder only strengthens the reader's conviction that this should have never happened. Frank is sharply critical of the adults around her, and of her own writing. She spent much of her time hiding away, trying to revise her journal after she heard on the radio that something like it could be considered a historical document. She was a fiery young lady, but the main appeal of Frank's diary is that she cannot talk back to her critics. In all likelihood, she died of typhus in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, her pages might be fiery with emotion, but she is unable to condemn the people who turned her family into the Gestapo. She is unable to report what happened at Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, because Frank's main appeal to us is that she is dead. We lament the life that she didn't get to live, and it's not immoral to lament that. But people valorize her for her famous affirmation that the world is truly good at heart. And we valorize it because it allows society off of the hook. That gift of grace and absolution from a murdered Jew, 
exactly the gift that lies at the heart of Christianity, is what millions of people are so eager to find in Frank's hiding place, in her writings, in her legacy. It is far more gratifying to believe that an innocent dead girl offered us grace than to recognise the obvious. Frank wrote about people being truly good at heart before meeting people who weren't. Horn is not saying that reading this book is wrong, that we are wrong for practising empathy. Instead, she criticises the blind valorization of Frank's brand. Frank was devout to the Jewish God, and her book reads as sincere in that regard. But other Jews were unable to hold on to their faith during these times. For example, Elie Wiesel's Night is a less known book, but he was a child who worked as a labourer in Buchenwald. He renounced God because of the horrors he saw. Famously, in an interview, he said, Do you still have faith in God as the ultimate redeemer? I would be within my rights to give up faith in God, and I could invoke six million reasons to justify such a decision, but I am incapable of straying from the path charted by my forefathers, who felt duty bound to live for God. Without the faith of my ancestors, my own faith in humanity would be diminished. So my wounded faith endures. Now, Horn is not invoking terrible suffering to denounce the Jewish God. That is not her point. Jews in concentration camps held secret services, and for what it's worth, it kept them sane and willing to live another day. That is not something we can ignore. But what I am saying, as Horn does, is that we cannot appropriate the language of a naive child to make ourselves feel better for the failures of law and democracy and liberalism and God. The tragedy of Frank's death is not only the life that she didn't get to live, but that if she were alive, we wouldn't want to hear about her. As with the six million murdered. Because after all, people love dead Jews. Horn is also concerned about how we present the Holocaust to new generations. She writes about her experience of visiting an Auschwitz exhibition that came to her home city. She recalls leaving the exhibition and seeing a television screen that had Holocaust survivors recounting their stories on a loop. And she remarks upon none of them speaking Yiddish. Neither has she read any survivors retell their stories in Yiddish, the language that 80% of the victims would have spoken? There is a practical reason for this, of course. A Holocaust museum in America being run at a profit has an incentive to speak the main language of Americans, which is English. But you lose the sense of who these people actually were. This is one of the most remarkable things I found in the documentary, Shoah. The interview format has the director ask a question, the translator translates the question, the interviewee replies in their native tongue, and the translator relays the question, and so on. There is a magic to be found in this approach, and not speaking over the survivor, you get to hear what they sound like, the, the weariness of their voice, their intonation, the idiosyncrasies, and it's still important for English speakers to know what these people went through and what they had to say about it. But this is something that I feel passionate about, and I'm glad that I'm not the only one. Horn also writes of her experience in that exhibition, about the curated emotions she felt. It was a very well put together experience, and she marvels about how relentless it was. You know, no fact was too insignificant. But she found herself getting annoyed by the scale of it all, as if the tour that she took wallowed in its own misery. In wallowing, we allow ourselves to feel bad, and then we can feel good for feeling bad. Pride in knowing that the murder of six million Jews was categorically wrong. We feel bad about this, and then we fail to interrogate what led a society to do it. It individualizes the problem. The logic is, evil people kill Jews. Evil people don't feel bad for killing Jews. I feel bad about murdered Jews, therefore I can never be evil. Horn poses that showing people the extent to which Nazis mechanized Jew murder, individualizing these evil acts, and not critiquing capitalism and liberalism, might only give people ideas. Yes, everyone must learn about the Holocaust so as not to repeat it. But this has come to mean that anything short of the Holocaust is, well, not the Holocaust. The bar is rather high. Doxing Jewish journalists is definitely not the Holocaust. Harassing Jewish college students is also not the Holocaust. Trolling Jews on social media is not the Holocaust either, even when it involves photoshopping them into gas chambers. It is quite amazing how many things are not the Holocaust. This was the ultimate flaw in my friend's logic from the beginning. You don't study history because the Holocaust is all that mattered. No! 
The Holocaust is not a metaphor for how depraved humanity can be. Because dead Jews are not a metaphor. Jews are not actors in a morality play, finger-wagging at society and cussing us out for our sins. They are not your metaphor. They were killed for real, tangible political reasons. They were expendable because white people wanted to feel more secure in themselves. And I keep repeating, the failure of law, the failure of science, the failure of liberalism. Because we blame the Nazis, the war, and indirectly the Jews. And in assigning blame, this allows us to abdicate actually taking responsibility for the centuries of violence against Jews. Violence and persecution are just that. A swastika isn't the Holocaust, but it is violence. Slurs aren't the Holocaust, but it is violence. Anything and everything short of the Holocaust is violence. And love is not the answer here. Because you do not have to love Jews for them to be worthy of humanity. Their religion and traditions are valuable because they are human. That is not love. That is basic respect for your fellow man. I tend to be introspective, and I have read Jewish anthropologist Ernst Becker's book, The Denial of Death. I do not think that people do everything altruistically. You know, people create essays and art because they want others to think that they are clever. To see the way that they want to be seen reflected back at them, represented as others' praise. I am not so smart, and I am not so moral because I critique the legacy of Jew hatred. It, it, this is a hobby to me, but in spite of myself. I do think that this is a genuinely important topic, and I want to share this information with everyone my age. It's a video I say because it's the easiest way for my generation to absorb information. You know, give me sober activism anytime, rather than roast-tinted fatalism. That's what Viktor Frankl said. And I feel so strongly about this because the future of anti-Semitism absolutely relies on ignorance being endemic. Upon downplaying the ways in which anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism has shaped the very foundations of our society. This is where this chapter is going to end. I am pausing here to offer the viewer an out because the next chapter is going to discuss Holocaust denial. I am obviously not going to endorse or advocate for it, but I believe it to be the future of anti-Semitism. So I think it's essential to discuss it. If that will upset you, please feel free to skip to the conclusion. Holocaust denial is perhaps the fastest possible way to get fired from your job. It is maybe the most morally reprehensible belief to hold, aside from maybe pedophilia. And I'm not going to well actually you there because it is just that. I cannot put into words my disdain for Holocaust deniers. Some backstory for those of you who don't know. Before I started this short series, I made one about the Port Arthur Massacre. That was the catalyst for gun control in Australia, and the massacre occurred in my home state. The series, titled Acting and Coleslaw, dived unnecessarily deep into the conspiracy theories that surround the massacre. This is the most taboo subject imaginable in my home state. Some fringe right-wing libertarian types believed that an NWO-style group commissioned the shooting to take away Australian guns. No one had ever done a study of this group before, and I decided I would be the first to perform an ethnographic analysis of the community and debunk as many of the claims as I could. I noted very early on that the Port Arthur Truth community are very anti-Semitic, or at least they're comfortable enough to ignore it. It was because of this that I first became interested in the history of anti-Semitism, because I wanted to understand the emotional and historical factors of their psyche. And after I finished that series, I found that Port Arthur Truth has way too many similarities with Holocaust Denial. It's not a one-to-one, -one. Holocaust Deniers are a lot more sophisticated, but it was too close for comfort. And because of that, I have researched Holocaust Denial quite extensively. It is fascinating. So similarly as I did with my Port Arthur series, I'm not going to say that there is a second side worth considering, because the Holocaust only has the dubious distinction of being the most well-documented war crime in the history of humanity. Instead, I want to investigate Holocaust denial from an academic position. Without empathy, I want to see what makes these people tick and why they say what they do. So grab your popcorn, get snuggled up in a blankie, because this is about to be quite a doozy. Alright, 
At its core, Holocaust denial is built around revisionism. Revisionism is a method of retelling history. It aims to explore historical events in an attempt to understand said event in a completely different perspective, often the perspective of persecuted peoples. The best example of this, and the one that I use to explain it easiest, is Gallipoli. I'm not sure how well known the invasion of Gallipoli by the Anzacs is outside of Australia, but here it is a very big deal. In 1915, the British Empire wanted to capture Turkey in World War I so that they could remove the Ottoman Empire, specifically modern Turkey, from the Central Powers. And due to British miscommunication, the Anzacs landed on the wrong beach and they were subsequently slaughtered. The invasion reached a stalemate, and the Anzacs were forced to retreat before the end of 1915. Today, the relations between Turkey and Australia are good, and every year the two states come together to mourn the tragic loss of life that took place at Gallipoli. A revisionist reading of Gallipoli would say that the battle was no stalemate. The Ottoman forces successfully repelled a brutal colonial attempt. They won. Their defense was as magnificent as Suleiman himself. Britain wanted to end the war quicker by denying Germany extra soldiers. But the Allies also wanted to access the Ottoman Empire's vast wealth in oil and rich history. Of course, Istanbul was formerly known as Constantinople. It was an ill-planned colonization project, so revisionism is not inherently a devious or insidious method of analyzing history. Because using the guise of the historian's integrity to justify atrocities is immoral and not academic. The best example of this would be how some Americans reframe the Confederacy and after the Civil War, but that's a whole topic. Another series would have to be done to explain it all. So, Holocaust deniers attempt to revise history, and the people who write pseudo-academically about the Holocaust are incredibly sophisticated and dangerous people. We have a stereotype of Holocaust deniers being thick-skulled skinheads without a brain cell, or they're kooks who believe that aliens are going to read their minds. And certainly, there have been people out there like this, but the academic or high-level deniers are far more insidious. Rare do they outright say that the Holocaust didn't happen. Instead, they claim that the history has been exaggerated, and in our haste to get the war over, the exaggerations were made to try Nazi officers and to protect Allied assets. And the first person to analyze Holocaust denial academically was scholar Deborah Lipstadt. In the world of academia, Lipstadt is a rock star. Even today, people still admire her, and a movie was made about her experience of being sued by a Holocaust denial. I couldn't let that stand and ever face a survivor and consider myself a responsible historian. So we fought, and for those of you who haven't seen Denial, spoiler alert, we won. Lipstadt is a fiery writer, and her work is a precursor to much of the conspiracism research that I have read. She commands that you should not debate Holocaust deniers, because the act of debate infers that there is a side worth hearing. And her book, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, has been hailed as a masterwork. It is considered to be the most definitive source about Holocaust denial in the 20th century. In the interest of keeping up to date with more contemporary research, I also read Denying History by Jewish historian Alex Grubman and conspiracism scholar Michael Shermer. I talked about him a bit in part four of my Port Arthur series, and only after I published that video did I learn that he has been called out for sexual misconduct, which, come on, dude. But I'm interested in the latter book because of its ending, not the explicit debunking, because much of it is informed by Lipstadt's own work. Lipstadt starts from the position of deniers having nothing useful to tell us about the practice of history, so she seeks to understand what their beliefs say about them epistemically. Deniers are wolves in sheep's clothing. Many of us have been taught to think there are facts and there are opinions. After studying deniers, I think differently. There are facts, there are opinions, and there are lies. And what deniers want to do is take their lies, dress them up as opinions, maybe edgy opinions, maybe sort of out-of-the-box opinions, but then if they're opinions, they should be part of the conversation. And then they encroach on the facts. She notes that revisionism is their framework and how they advertise themselves and their ideas, but she seeks to interrogate what their motivations are. More often than not, they are deniers and minimizers. 
This means that their goal is not to explicitly deny that the Holocaust ever happened, because such a position would be impossible to argue for. But instead, they revised history with the goal of making Nazism acceptable again. The mainstream and correct narrative is that the Holocaust was a horrific crime against humanity. The Nazis orchestrated the Holocaust. The internal logic of the ideology the Nazis stood for intrinsically led to the Holocaust. Therefore, fascism and the Nazis are beneath consideration in contemporary politics. The goal of Holocaust denial is to diminish the significance of the Holocaust, and to make fascism and eugenics palatable again. In order to do so, they need to reframe how history was told. As Lipstadt herself puts it, Holocaust denial offers them a means of both wiping out that historical black mark. If there was no Holocaust, then cooperating with the Nazis becomes less inexcusable. The argument goes, if there was no Holocaust, then there's nothing wrong with being a Nazi. They do this because justifying the Holocaust has failed. It was an unjustifiable act, so in denying it, they don't have to explain it. And this is not just an act of cowardice, but it's also an act of utility. Instead of getting bogged down in ethical debate, of which they could never win, they attempt to make an argument that no one can win. In revising history, you can erase everything that is hard to explain to a gentile audience. In this video, I'm not framing myself as having a conversation with deniers, but they might object by saying that calling anyone you don't like a Nazi is reductive. And that is true, Goblin's Law and all, but if you're advocating for fascist ideas, then that makes you a fascist. Makeup on a pig does not make it beautiful. And because they're impossible to speak to in good faith, you should ignore all of their objections because they're wrong about everything. And that is not ignorance, but it is bad faith masquerading as ignorance. The classic technique that all conspiracists use is what I like to call the question with no answer trick. Theorists will give you a loaded question that is counter to the official narrative. This question makes you feel as if there's been some trickery afoot, but when you actually ask the theorist what the question means, they cannot answer you. Because the utility of this question, unlike most questions asked, is to leave you with a conspiratorial pain in your belly. This question with no answer then prompts you to go looking for an answer via conspiratorial sources. Consider the mortuary truck. Holocaust denial is full to the brim of this kind of trick. Loaded questions that are designed to give deniers an epistemic out. Before we look at some of the techniques that Holocaust deniers use, it's worth exploring why the Holocaust would be faked in the first place. And take it as a given that all of this is reprehensible, by the way. Because, hypothetically, it would be an incomprehensible amount of work, right? You'd have to build camps, plant evidence of the gassings inside the camps, convince millions of actual people to partake in the event, hide the people who were supposedly killed, convince the Nazis to support the Jews, which they wouldn't want to do, and make sure that all of the evidence converges upon the same conclusion. It's an insane amount of work, but to what end exactly? The most advanced deniers argue that all of this was faked in pursuit of the establishment of Israel. You recall from chapter 2 that anti-Semites already hate Israel because they're afraid of the unity it represents. So deniers assert that the Holocaust would provide the world with a satisfactory reason to allow Israel to establish itself and gain support from Western powers. Further, the Holocaust was faked so that bankers could use it to shield themselves against ridicule. Some hypothetical Jewish bankers could dismiss all of this anti-capitalist criticism by using the Holocaust as a trump card. So not only are they denying the pain the Holocaust caused, the generations of life lost, the lack of a place to bury the dead, the trauma, but deniers seek to diminish the moral authority of survivors. Because the wider public gives victims a level of authority over their stories. If you de-victimize a people, you strip them of their moral authority. And if you can claim to be a victim, that moral authority is conferred on or restored to you. By undermining the authority of survivors, they not only push forth their political agenda, but they continue to perpetrate the pain that survivors went through. Anyone who is watching this video is more than likely further to the left than the average person. In other words, leftists who actually like guns. But in case anyone else has stuck around for this long, it's worth exploring the free speech issue. Because deniers will claim that in being censored, their freedom is being tarnished. This is a particularly sneaky trick because Nazis don't like freedom of speech. Remember, 
Nazis hated America for their principles of equality and freedom. And even if they were too close for comfort when it came time to write miscegenation laws, Nazis were authoritarians. So, when they proclaim their right to the microphone, just note that they wouldn't extend the same argument to you. Fascists will use whatever they can to get ahead of you, and they act in such bad faith that it's just not practical to humour them. As Lipschatz says, they have a right to speak, but we have just as much right to silence them with our rebuttals. Denier's arguments can number into the thousands. There are plenty of variations, but they always come back to nine types of argument. A nonagon, if you will. I will discuss each one as I go. For time's sake, I won't go into depth with debunking each individual one, but I do highly recommend Lipschatz's book if you're curious about the particulars. One, this is a numbered list already. A, Nazis wanted immigration, not annihilation, to solve their Jewish problem. The argument here is that Nazis, from early and selective quotes, didn't want to deal with all of the carnage of eliminating all the Jews from the face of the earth. Instead, they wanted to force them to live somewhere remote and impoverished and leave them to their own devices. The subtext here is that they would starve to death or kill each other. There is an individual grain of truth to this one, but it is ultimately cherry-picked propaganda. Early on in Hitler's regime, there was a plan to export all German Jews and leave them to their own devices in Madagascar. In fact, Lawrence Reese's book covers this argument extensively. He concludes that, Although this might have been their original plan, the plan changed dramatically. Nazis were toying with gas as early as 1939, and we, in fact, have the notes of the Wangsi Conference, in which high-ranking Nazis first discussed mass gassing of Jews. No Jews were gassed at any camp in Germany, especially Auschwitz. Pretty audacious one, isn't it? Auschwitz is the most widely known concentration camp, so the argument claims that if no one died at the busiest and nastiest camp, it follows that no one did anywhere else. Auschwitz was primarily a work camp. That is why it is so famous, because when people arrived, they weren't immediately gassed. They were either selected for work, or then they were gassed. Many, many survivors recall the opening gates of Auschwitz, and that's why they're so famous. Now, even if this were true, the Nazis would still be guilty of ethnic cleansing. The Nuremberg Laws, the sterilization and gassing of disabled persons, and the mass murder of Jews in the back of metal trucks. But we have plenty of evidence of people being gassed at the camps. Sonderkommandos, for instance, led Jews into the chambers, pulled gold teeth from the dead, and then burned them. We've also tested the walls of the gas chambers in Auschwitz, and they have been shown to have abnormal amounts of poison gases like Zyklon B, of which were used by the Nazis since 1939. Most of the Jews disappeared and hid in Soviet territory. This is the unanswerable question again. You gesture towards millions of supposed people who went into hiding, and you act as if it being said is proof enough. This point is all verbal gesture, and it is very silly. It's worth mentioning that most of these arguments came up before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and with 30 plus years since then, and with 11 million people who were murdered, not a single one has shown up since. And sure, after the 90s many of them would be dead from old age, but no old people? No one who was a child? No one who had been hiding since they were a child? Nothing has come forward. The fact that this point is still so prominent is a testament to the denier's intrinsic bad faith. The old arguments aren't necessarily convincing to outsiders, but they are comforting to those who are already inside of the movement. Create the idea of 11 million Siberian Jews and you can continue being anti-Semitic unimpeded. There is nothing here and it's antiquated. Anyone who did die in Nazi care were political prisoners and criminals. So this argument is another sleight of hand. No one died in Auschwitz, but if they did, they were mere political prisoners. What's so insidious about this argument is that the core premise is that anyone who did die in Auschwitz deserved it. And it is certainly true that some of the first Nazi concentration camps were set up for political dissidents. Many of the early chapters in Reese's book focuses on some of the people who survived these camps, but they were quickly expanded to forcing Jews into these camps, even in the early days. So this is simply ridiculous. No Jews have demanded studies into the Holocaust, so it can't have happened. Which is bizarre. Quite bizarre. I mean, to take one example, the film Shoah itself was commissioned by the State of Israel. But if that isn't convincing enough, there are 
hundreds of organizations founded by Jews that have goals to educate people about how the Holocaust happened. I mean, in chapter four, we talked about Dara Horn's criticism of some of these things. We also only happen to have hundreds of hours of survivor testimony. All the money that was made from Schindler's List was used to film the last Holocaust survivor's testimonies, and we only have hundreds and hundreds of hours of it. This is another example of something that might have been more convincing in the 1970s. But with the advent of the internet, I can just look up any number of studies and read them and see that they were commissioned by Israel or Holocaust education boards. Nazis, who were on trial at Nuremberg, were tortured into giving statements of guilt. This one is interesting because it's a self-justifying statement. The fact that no Nazis at Nuremberg or after tried to claim the whole thing was fake is proof of torture. I recommend Anne Tulsa's classic book, The Nuremberg Trial, which clearly illuminates to us that the Nazis were treated far better than they deserved. And many Nazis actually got off because under law, they couldn't be proven guilty enough. This is just verbal gesture. In fact, Nazis were quite proud of the mayhem of the Holocaust. Not only a few of them, in the hour of their deaths, regretted anything. Accusers must prove that the Holocaust happened, not the accused. This argument aims to turn an argument that deniers can't win into an argument that no one can. David Irving tried to do this when he sued Deborah Lipstadt. He lost, by the way. Further, most of the perpetrators are dead now, and to expect the same from mostly dead survivors is ridiculous. Historians often advocate for a convergence of evidence to tell history. Schirmer and Grobman actually talk about this in their book, how we have thousands of examples of sources, and how they all converge onto a similar conclusion. Something of a catchphrase of this channel will have to be repeated again. The burden of proof lies upon the deniers here. The consensus exists, and we have an insurmountable amount of evidence that affirms the fact that the Holocaust happened. And when deniers in the past have done this, they have always distorted it to fit their own needs. We'll come back to that specific last point in just a moment. The fact that there are disagreements on the specifics means that it all must have been faked. This is a correct contradiction to the previous point, which is a classic conspiracy move. You oscillate between convenient beliefs, depending upon the situation. Remember how the anti-Semite switches between anti-communist and anti-capitalist beliefs to score points in whatever arguments they are having. It's worth mentioning that all Holocaust deniers are anti-Semites, but not all anti-Semites are Holocaust deniers even if a massive percent of them are. Scholars still have fierce debate about the particulars of the Holocaust. But this is a good thing, actually, because if all historians agreed on a single number, that would be suspicious, would it not? Lipschitz says that the fact that historians actually disagree on individual points proves that the Holocaust happened because a difference of opinion is healthy. Lipstadt argues that this is the best example of a quirky denier tendency, faith in search of reason. This means that their faith that the Holocaust didn't happen leads them to shape facts and beliefs to suit their own purposes. And Frank's diary was forged. Yeah, that's a thing that they believe. Interestingly, the authenticity of the diary has always been up for debate. As discussed in the last chapter, Frank rewrote portions of her diary so that it might be used as a historical document. So there are actually a few different versions. For a very loose example, my version of the diary comes from the 1960s. The wording is slightly different from the contemporary version, and some entries have been added and removed. But this is because of censorship law and translation issues. The diary features some crude humour, surprisingly harsh passages about Frank's mother, and passages about her developing womanhood. Censors removed such quote-unquote offensive passages, which is code for periods and teenagers being horny. But deniers claim that the entire diary was faked for shits and giggles, I guess? They have to do this because the diary is possibly the most famous document related to World War II, so it is pivotal to take it down and create doubt, which, no we know that Frank wrote it. Again, all of this has been a sampling of the nine most prominent arguments that I've seen in my research. They get increasingly speculative and more ridiculous than that. And you've probably seen that these arguments are pretty bad. No one is inclined to believe them unless they are already sympathetic to Nazi Germany. So let's discuss some of the specific techniques they use to distort information. The first technique is a matter of switching the goalposts. 
So normally in this context, it means shifting acceptable language so that they can score an easy win. And deniers certainly attempt to do this. But I find the way that they attempt to turn a game that they can't win into one that no one can win is more interesting. There is always an element of relativism to revisionism. But here they turn questions about specific issues into ones so broad that it's difficult to answer. How do you prove that a million people were killed is a hard question to answer because you need at least a million and one sources. So they demand absolute proof and nothing else will satisfy them. So they have to market themselves as the ones who need to be convinced. This is what I mean by shifting the goalposts. By attempting to dissuade the denier, you implicitly take on a few of their premises and that gives them a small victory. They're not worthy of being convinced because they're bad faith actors and Nazis. Secondly, deniers are obsessed with what is not known. It is impossible to know, for example, what life was like inside of a gas chamber because no one that we know of survived. So they will focus on those people, those impossible to know people, instead of anyone who was actually outside of the chamber. By focusing on what is unknowable, they never have to assert a position of their own. By continually answering questions without regard for the actual quality of their answers, they aim to exhaust and frustrate the historian, and if the historian walks away from them, then the denier can claim that as a victory. Third, the denier knowingly distorts the facts to full gullible people. Holocaust denial was so prominent in America because not many Americans spoke German or Polish, so they implicitly had to rely on translations. Deniers like Irving distorted the facts, and when they were called out, they can simply claim that their translations were a mistake. But the interesting thing about mistakes is that you would often expect them to go against the denier. At least some of the time, right? These mistakes, however, are always in the denier's favour, which more than suggests these mistakes were entirely intentional. At the same time, they tear into the mistakes of historians and demand absolute proof from them. This isn't hypocrisy to them, because they don't actually believe in any salient points. They only care about delegitimizing the Holocaust, and any victory is a victory. Lipstadt refers to this as an incestuous merry-go-round, in which falsehoods continue even though they make no sense. Fourth, the focus on Israel is a sneaky retort to any and all criticism the denier receives. Because if you prove them wrong, you are obviously an agent. I'll give you an example. Several times when I did my Port Arthur series, I was referred to as an ASIO agent. Because anyone who has critiques of a conspiracy theory is obviously not rational and they're bad faith and they must be paid by the government, even though I fucking hate the government, and I said so many times throughout that series. By doing this, the denier can turn to their audience and tell them not to listen to you. This conspiracy theory is so intrinsically anti-Semitic that it is impossible to claim otherwise. So they have to embrace that, and then they have to appeal to their audience's worst impulses. This creates a kind of filtering effect, where people who are actually inclined to fact check will just stop listening to you because the content is so obviously horrible, while the extremist can freely engage with it. This means that most of the people who engage with deniers are other deniers, and that means that the work is mostly viewed positively by the in-group. This is because, in a self-justifying way, anyone who dislikes or criticizes Holocaust denial is obviously paid off by Israel. The lie is easier to buy into because verisimilitude is cheap for those who are desperate for it. This has been a pretty brief rundown of the hellscape that is Holocaust denial. And the most interesting thing about the theories is how they masquerade as academic. But they have no academic rigor. Some deniers, like David Irving, were respected historians. And that was what made them dangerous. Their work reads like a history article instead of anti-Semitic rambling, which made the uninitiated and the gullible susceptible to their arguments. But it's worthwhile exploring what these arguments actually represent. Deborah Lipstadt calls this community the manifestation of the failures of memory and how fragile our sense of history can be. Lipstadt has conviction and she herself is sentimental, but her work is quite objective and not prone to that sentiment. She's not terribly interested in the emotions that underlay denial, because rightfully so, they don't matter a terrible amount, because they are wrong. But you know me. I want to understand the emotions that underlay the worst of human impulses. This is where Sherman and Grobman greatly impressed me. They spent the last chapter of their book exploring why denial hurts us so much. There is something primary about Holocaust denial that touches the wound on the raw as no other extremist claim can. Holocaust denial is shocking because its target is so shocking. 
To deny the Holocaust is to deny something even deeper, our search to understand extreme acts of inhumanity. Attempts by historians, theologians, philosophers, sociologists, and psychologists to explain the Holocaust have been a deliberate and systematic attempt to get to the core of the human condition by asking the most fundamental question of all. Why did this happen? The denier's answer? It didn't. Is wrong. Pure and simple. And I think they're right. Denial denies us the opportunity to respond to the Holocaust, to the failures of law, liberalism, journalism, and equality. But I can't help us feel as if they're slightly off the mark, because this sort of falls into the Holocaust as a metaphor trap that we discussed last chapter. It didn't happen so that we could learn from it. It happened because societies refused to see their fellow humans as people. I think that actually Holocaust denial is the very future of anti-Semitism. Because throughout history, people have denied Jews something. They've always been blamed for something they didn't do, whether that be the blood libel, the death of Christ, well poisoning, or conspiring against all of society. They've never denied Jews their rights to their pain. Instead, Judeophobes relish in the narratives of spite and vindictiveness. They say that these emotions drive Jews to control us. The anti-Semite has always partaken in the persecution with glee and malice. And the ultimate lesson here is that Holocaust deniers love that six million Jews were gassed and cremated. They just do. They wish it was more. They wish there were no Jews, not less. But in denying Jews their pain, they continue to partake in the horror of the Holocaust. Denying Jews their right to their pain will be the future of anti-Semitism because it is the current present of anti-Semitism. This is where the series was supposed to end. Two clean episodes. And then the second episode was split in half for logistical reasons. And then my sensitivity reader Emmett pointed out to me that there remained some very important points that were still yet to be discussed. So in the final episode of the anti-semitism series, we will discuss anti-semitism today. In a post-internet world, in that video, we will discuss how it works epistemically, how it cozies up with conspiracism, and how age-old tricks were repackaged using modern lingo. I don't want to talk about Kanye West, but that might be a whole thing. Hope you'll join us on the next episode. I want to thank Peter for doing his classic reading thing for this script, because it was very long, and he gave me some very good critiques. And of course, I've already mentioned Emmett, but I have to thank them again, because this series would be nowhere near as good without their help. And I hope you join us when we discuss the psychology and philosophy of anti-Semitism. That is fucking... Do you support Holocaust awareness? Um, I mean... I don't know if I've thought about it. I mean, I would. I mean, why did you hesitate so much? Nah, I mean, it's the first I've heard of it. The Holocaust? Well, I mean, just the awareness and all that stuff. Do I mean, you believe the Holocaust happened? I do, yeah. How many Jews died in the Holocaust? Oh, I, don't, I can't give you an exact number. I wasn't there. Six million. Do were, were you there? Was I in the Holocaust? Well, I mean, were you around at the time? No, it was in the 40s. All right, so the number is just, you know, what we read in, in books and, you know, historical novels and things like that. Um, and what do you say we make, an, uh, make a commercial break? Okay. Okay.